And I am logged in as an administrator on the ipt.gbif.org test website. And uh, the first thing I'm going to do is uh, create a resource. And for the purposes of this, I'm going to create a resource, but then I'm going to switch to an existing resource that already has metadata in it so that I am not uh, uh, using this time to type up metadata. So this shortening field when you're creating a resource is what becomes your URL in the IPT. So it's best to be descriptive for what you are doing. For today's demonstration, I'm using a invert paleo data set from the Paleontological Resource Research Institution in Ithaca. So I'm going to call this PRI invert paleo test. And it is an occurrence type. Um, we could also do checklist, event, or metadata only. And then I'm simply going to create it. So got a resource now with that is ready for me to populate with source data, mappings, metadata, and to publish it. So I'm now going to switch to the one that has the metadata. And I'm going to begin by adding the source data. As Carol mentioned in her presentation, there are a variety of data types that you can use as source data. You can connect with a database connection, but for the purposes of today's exercise, I'm going to be using um, a text file and a CSV file. So the first file I'm going to add is occurrence data, and it is in a text file format. Once you've selected the file, you can add it. And it comes into a confirmation screen. I can see that I have 39 columns in my data set. I can see that there's one header row. Um, it comes in with the default encoding for UTF-8, which is typically what we use in the community to encode our data. But should it be something else, um, there is an information button that you can use to select one of the other ones, or you can hand type it in. Um, it recognizes the field delimiters, and there is a preview button that looks like an eye that allows you to get a preview of what that data in that text file looks like. So it all looks good to me, so I'm going to hit Save. And over here on the right, you can see I've got a text file added. Now I'm going to add my second file, which is a CSV file. And this one contains images. So I'll do the same process by adding it. I review the delimiters, header row, I preview it. You can see that I've got the image information, and I will save it. Next step, I'm going to add the mappings. And the first mapping I'm going to add will be for the occurrence data. So I will choose the occurrence core. We'll click Add. And then I need to choose my source data. I had two different source data, so I want to choose the matching occurrence file. And click Save. And the IPT auto maps what it can. So if the occurrence file contains fields that were already named with the Darwin Core terms, it auto maps those. 
So I can tell at the top in the green message bar that it auto-mapped 36 columns, but I had 39. So three fields still remain to be mapped. And I also get a warning that basis of record is a required field. So the first thing I'm going to address is basis of record. So I scroll down the list, I find the basis of record field, and I did not have that in my data, so I'm going to use the predefined vocabulary that is available for this field. And I'm going to choose fossil specimen. And then I will save. And every time you save, it takes you back up to the top of the page. And so now my message has gone away, but I still remember that I've got three fields that I need to map. And over here on the left-hand side, you can see hyperlinks. And these hyperlinks are based on the Darwin Core um, term categories. So they match up exactly to what you will see on the Darwin Core uh, website. So I'm going to click on the unmapped columns, which will take me down quickly to the bottom of my page, and I can see which three fields didn't map. So I've got catnum, collector, and sign name. Well, I know sign name would go into the tax on information, so I'm going to click into that section, and I will find scientific name, and I will click the drop down, and I will map it to my name. And then I know the other two fields are in my occurrence section. So I'm going to click there and I will add catnum, the catalog number. And then if you're not as familiar with Darwin Core as I am, you may not know which field collector should go to. And in that case, you can use the information button to pull up the definition. It will give you the definition from Darwin Core, it will give you a link out to the Darwin Core, and it will give you some examples. So from here I can see that the primary collector observer should go and recorded by. And to remove the box you just click on it again and it goes away. So I'm going to add collector here and then I will save again. So there are um, several other fields that have predefined uh, vocabularies that you can add. So type is one of those, and this is a uh, occurrence of physical objects. And I'm also going to add the language of the data, which is in English. And then there are a few other really nice features in here. Um, there is a filtering feature. And filtering allows you to specify uh, data. So say you had some sensitive data you needed to remove, you could do that here. Or say you weren't ready to publish all of your data. You could, um, or you only want to publish part of your collection. You can make a filter here to do that. So. In this example, we're only going to publish the uh, class equal to gastropoda. We'll save that. And then the other um, nice feature, um, you can see examples of five records in the data so you can make sure that your fields are lining up correctly. Well, I noticed when I was in the taxon section that in the kingdom, my source sample says animals instead of animalia. So there are a couple different ways you could correct that. You could, instead of using the kingdom, you could um, unmap that field, and you could type in animalia, or you could use the translation feature, and the translation feature will bring up a unique list of all the values in that field. So in this case, 
it is only using animals, and I can add what the translated value should be. And save it. And it'll save once more here. And one other thing I should mention about the filter is that there is a condition here that asks if you want to do it before translation or after translation. So um, if for some reason we were filtering on Animalia, then you would want to do it after translation. Um, in this case, it really wouldn't matter if I did it before or after. So uh, the mappings are all complete for the occurrence. Now I'm going to go back to my edit page, my manage page, and I'm going to add the second mapping. So this time I have images, and I have a choice. I could use simple multimedia or I could use the Audubon media description. And for today's purposes, I'm going to use the Audubon media description. I'm going to click Add, and then I need to choose my source data again. And this time I'm going to use the image file. Now the Audubon media description um, can be comprehensive of other media types besides images, so you might have sound or video. Uh, this particular file only has images. So I hit Save, and in this one, all of my fields mapped, and so I don't have any unmapped fields to add or change. And I do want to point out that this file contains the occurrence IDs, just like the uh, occurrence file did. So this identifier here uniquely identifies each image, and then that uh, links back to each unique occurrence um, or multiple occurrences. Sorry, I'm not saying that right. Um, occurrences can have more than one image associated with it. So you might have one occurrence number with uh, two or three different images associated. And the I Did Bio website has um, some recommendations for um, preferable, uh, their preferred identifiers, and um, the other important piece is the uh, access URI, which um, needs to be an online um, object, sorry, an online URL um, so that the images can then be uploaded to the image galleries on, say, um, the IDIG Bio portal or the GBIF portal. So I'm going to save this one now. And I'm going to use the hyperlink next to resource title to go back to my manage page. And so now you can see I've got two data sets two data files, and I've got two sets of mappings. And now we're going to look at the metadata. Um, I mentioned that I pre-populated the metadata for this. And we've got um, since I did some editing of the metadata and we're only publishing the gastropoda for this, I'm actually going to change this to gastropoda. And the reason you want to fill in your metadata is so that the end users of the data will have a good idea of if this data set is fit for their use. Um, this is also where you set the publishing organization for this data set. And in this case, we're just using a test organization. Um, this is also where you set the licensing for or waiver for the data set. And GBIF is um, allowing three waiver or data licenses or data waiver, 
we've got the Creative Commons CCBY, the Creative Commons CCBY non-commercial, and then there's the public domain. You can fill in a description. Then you have all of your contact information. And you can hit save. And then as you work through the, the metadata pages in IPT, um, this is, the IPT is a really lovely way to add all of your metadata. And I, I feel like having worked with BERTNET for so long um, and as an aggregator, that with the IPT, metadata has gotten much better um, because it's a lot easier for people to do the data entry on it. So there's a geographic coverage section. Uh, there's taxonomic coverage. And I'm going to add taxonomic coverage here for gastropoda. And I'm going to select the rank of class and save. And then there are a lot of other sections that you can continue to add metadata. And one of those that I want to look at is citations. I was um, beginning to say GBIF is beginning to, here at the Secretariat, do um, some really nice things with citations. Um, and uh, the DOIs that Kyle mentioned earlier, and um, to be able to report on those kind of things within the portal. So um, you can hand type a citation here, or you can use the auto generation for a citation. And this auto generation uses the data site preferred uh, recommendation for how to cite uh, a data set. I'm going to use that. And those are all the changes I'm going to make to the metadata right now. And I'm going to move back to the Manage Resources screen. And now we're ready to publish. Um, because I know that I want to register this data set with GBIF, I'm going to go ahead and make it public. But if I wasn't ready to make it public yet, um, I could publish a few times um, before I make it public. But I'm ready. So I'm going to hit the Publish button. Um, it pops up with a box for um, that you can put in some sort of summary about what you're publishing. So I'm publishing a new data set for CRI Astropoda. You can use this. Um, you don't have to, but you can use it, um, especially if you've made some changes. So maybe you only updated your metadata. So you could put in here that you um, the data set is republished, but it was just for metadata changes or say you did a whole lot of um, new digitization, you could indicate that you've added 10,000 more records, or this data set now contains images. So there's a lot you could do with this to uh, just give some more information about this version of the data set. So publishing is beginning, and it happens very quickly because this, this file is very small. Um, there's only 42 gastropoda records. Um, after publishing, it completed successfully, and it gives me a series of log messages that we can review to see what happened. So um, it says 70 lines did not match the filter criteria, and it only wrote for 42 records. Um, it actually created 201 records for the um, media. Um, it added the EML file. It added the meta file that uh, Carol talked about both of those. And then it began the validation process. So it validated um, that basis record is always present because that was a required field. And then it also validated that occurrence ID was present. That's another required field. And that it was unique and that every record had 
Um, and then it did similar validation um, for the extension. And then it said it was completely validated, it compressed it, and that it was generated successfully. So at this point, I'm going to go back to the resource overview. And typically, I would actually download it at this point and check it all before registering it with GDIF. But I'm ready to register it. We'll say that I've already checked it all. So I'm going to click register. And it asked me to confirm that I understand the GBIF sharing agreement. And I say yes. And at this point, it's contacting GBIF and registering the data set. It tells me that it successfully registered the data set in the registry. And if I go down here to the registration section, I now have a GBIF UID with my test organization. And it was endorsed, in this case, by DANBIF, which is the, the Danish node for GBIF. And I'm going to I'm going to give it a little bit of time to index at GBIF. And in the meantime, I'm going to download um, the Darwin Core archive. And I want to show you what the metadata looks like in the IPT. So I'm actually going to go to the home page so you could see what an end user might encounter in the home page. You can filter, open up the metadata page, and that's that URL I originally created with that short name. You can see all the information. I can see how many records are in the occurrence file. I can see how many are in the extension file. And I can download the Darwin Core Archive. And in the version section, I can see that note that I added. I'm going to download the file. And then quickly, I will open the file. And within that archive, that compressed file, when it was decompressed, you can see it's got the EML, the meta, there's the multimedia extension, and then there's the occurrence file. So just like that image that um, Carol showed in her slides. And now I'm going to see if the data has indexed at GBIF yet. And this is in a, in a test um, site, so it has. You can see all of the metadata. You can see the 42 records. all the records and I wanted to see some of the images the image and you can see a record with detail with an image. So you can see that this is near real time. Now, this was a small data set, so it was pretty simultaneous. But a larger data set may take time, more time, and then you also might encounter being in line behind other large data sets. So it can vary how quickly the indexing happens. But for our example today, it happened very quickly. Um, so. I, that's where I'm going to end my demonstration, and I'm going to hand it back to Kyle, and he's going to finish up.